Hello one and all, I am the Comics Kid 2099 and I am here to review a graphic novel called Fantastic Four Season 1. This book is written by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa and drawn by David Marquez. This book is part of a line of original graphic novels that, as far as I understand, are supposed to refamiliarize modern audiences with these characters that have been around since the early 1960s. This is not to be confused with the Ultimate Universe, which was created about a decade before the Season 1 graphic novels. The Ultimate Universe is more about reinventing the characters and concepts from the ground up and putting them all in their own brand new shared universe. The Season 1 books don't really interact with each other or create a new shared universe. Most of these books are supposed to be canonical with the rest of the Marvel Universe, as far as I can tell. I listened to an interview with Colin Bunn where he revealed that he had some ideas for the Spider-Man Season 1 graphic novel, and those ideas were rejected because the book needed to be completely canon according to the editor that he was working with. That will become important later. So like I said, this is not meant to be the Ultimate Universe, which completely rejects all canon and stories and just tried to take the same characters and insert them into the 21st century. As far as I understand it, the Season 1 books are still set in the same universe, but they exist because the origins for these characters were created 50 years ago and could use some updating. So in the case of X-Men Season 1, the book really didn't change or modify anything about the early years of the X-Men. It gave some more depth to some of the characters that was lacking in the 1960s, but it didn't really change, alter, revise, or contradict anything at all. Then the Doctor Strange Season 1 graphic novel is kind of in its own class altogether, because the comic book that tells the story of his origin was set years and years before the comics from the 60s, where he's doing his thing as the Sorcerer Supreme. And Greg Pak, as per an interview I read, said that his idea was to cover some of the ground in between the origin issue and his days as a fully formed superhero. So by definition, Doctor Strange Season 1 doesn't really contradict anything because there are no comics that are set in that time period that Pack was working in. Spider-Man Season 1 I reviewed a few months back, so I won't spend much more time talking about it here, but I will say I am not very familiar with the Spider-Man comics from the 1960s, so I can't readily say that Spider-Man Season 1 did or did not contradict any of the Silver Age stories. And so that brings us to Fantastic Four Season 1. No, I had not forgotten that I was reviewing this book. Remember when I said that Colin Bunn was instructed to keep Spider-Man Season 1 entirely canonical? Well, this book does not do that. We have a new character, Alyssa, in the form of Reed Richards' lab assistant, who we have never seen before, and the way I look at retcons is, if you are going to try and say that this character was always present from the beginning, then I have to then ask, okay, and where is she now? And the answer to that is that this character was not present from the beginning, and so she never appeared in the 50 years of Fantastic Four comics that came out before this book did. Then you have the Mole Man, who was historically the first villain that the Fantastic Four fought, and he is the first threat that they fight in this book. But while Fantastic Four Issue 1 ended with the Mole Man seemingly dying in his caves after kidnapping the Fantastic Four, this book shows Sue Storm and Reed Richards meeting with the Mole Man with kindness and offering him a job at the Baxter Building, which he then agrees to take. And then we have Namor, who goes from being a hobo with amnesia to remembering everything from his life as the Submariner, except that it is handled entirely different here than it was in the original Fantastic Four comics. Now, let me address a few things. One, I don't actually mind that this book seemingly goes out of its way to completely contradict the events laid down for the Fantastic Four back in the 1960s. While I do like and adore those comics from the 60s, in fact, I've said before that I would put the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man as the best stuff that Marvel was doing in the 60s, I don't mind that this book does what it does because, as far as I'm concerned, this book is set in an alternate universe. I'm not trying to be flippant by saying that this book doesn't air quotes count and so it is set in an alternate universe. I'm just looking at the facts. The Mole Man is handled entirely differently. 
we have a brand new character who I guess we're meant to accept that just kind of faded away after the formative years of the Fantastic Four. And we have all of these events that just do not mesh with the adventures of the Fantastic Four. And none of that bothers me because I can just accept that this is some alternate version of the Fantastic Four. In fact, I like this version of the Fantastic Four. I want to see more of them. Where is Fantastic Four Season 2 that shows how the Mole Man is the ambassador to Subterranea and is building an alliance with the surface world? I know this is never going to happen, but the thing is, when you alter some of these elements and do so in a way that makes me invested and interested in where you might go next, I kind of wish that this wasn't done as a, and this is the backstory of the Fantastic Four. Now go read Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four thing. I kind of wish this was done kind of like an ultimate version of the Fantastic Four, but not as part of the ultimate universe. Now, I sort of had this reaction to some of the other Season 1 books. Doctor Strange and X-Men I enjoyed quite a bit, and if the creative teams on those books respectively did a follow-up to their own books or returned to those characters in some way, I'd be happy. But with both of those, I also felt like if I am looking at this story as something that fits within the context of the Silver Age stories, then I can just go to the Doctor Strange comics from the 60s after reading Doctor Strange Season 1, and then it is like I'm reading the air quotes next story. But I don't have that with the Fantastic Four book here. Now, as I mentioned, I don't mind that this book is not consistent with the rest of the Fantastic Four's history in the 616 universe. But I know that this sort of thing matters more to other people. Maybe you are wanting this to be something that you could read as part of the Fantastic Four's existing history. I know if this had been something in a franchise that I really love, like the X-Men or Batman, then I might be more upset. So I get that some people won't be happy when they see this, and I get that. It's just not something that concerns me a whole lot. But ignoring the fact that this story is a little bit of an oddball as far as continuity goes, what does the story look like? Does it work? Well, if you know the Fantastic Four's origin, then you won't be very surprised by this book. But then it's not supposed to surprise you. This book is meant for people who aren't especially familiar with the Fantastic Four. So if you do know their origin very well, then you can still go and read this, but you're not exactly the intended audience. If you don't know the origin of the Fantastic Four, we are told that Reed Richards has hubris and he wants to be one of the first people in space who is not affiliated with NASA or any government in any way. He wants to be the first private citizen to privately go into space. This is in contrast to the reason the four went into space before, which was that they wanted to beat the communists into outer space. Now this is an element that I don't think anyone would mind being altered in the origin. These characters have been around for 50 years, but in story they must remain eternally young so that they can be financially viable for Marvel Comics. If Reed is in his 80s, he isn't going to be a character that many people will want to read about. So they have to keep the origin of the characters as an event that happened roughly 10 years ago, no matter what the year is right now. So the space race was not a thing that happened 10 years ago, but then we have to ask, well, why did they rush into space so quickly? Well, according to this book, it's because of Reed's hubris. Now, even with Reed's hubris, I'm still not sure why it had to happen like the next day after this book begins. We find out another ship is launching elsewhere at the exact same time, so apparently nobody will notice these guys launching into outer space. Anyway, one thing that is not altered in this version of the story is the reason why Sue and Johnny are going into space with Reed and Ben. Reed is a scientist, and this whole thing is his baby. Ben is a pilot, so it makes sense that Reed would have him go. In the 1960s, there was no given reason why Johnny and Sue went, other than the story needed them to be present when the origin happens so that they can be part of the Fantastic Four. And in this book, there is still no reason given. We're just told that it needed to be a four-person job, and that just doesn't quite work for me. I know the 2005 live-action movie isn't exactly the greatest thing in the world, but I like that it gave reasons for all of the four to be on the mission. So we have the cosmic rays transform these four into the superhumans that we know them to be. Now, I am ordinarily not the kind of guy who gets in a hissy fit when a science fiction book or a fantasy story doesn't fit into the realm of real science. I was definitely not looking for real science when I read a book with a giant monster that, as Sue Storm says, looks like it came out of a J.J. Abrams film. 
but some basic story logic would be nice. Like, if this story is trying so hard to update all of the silly and somewhat ridiculous elements of the Fantastic Four origin story, then why can't we have an explanation as to why each of the four are affected by the cosmic rays in a different way? They're all four in the exact same place doing the exact same thing, so why are they all transformed in entirely different ways? I get that in some versions of the story, they are affected by how they act before. Johnny is a hothead. Sue feels like she's invisible, Reed tries to stretch himself too thin, etc. But cosmic rays don't work that way, do they? They don't search your soul and decide that you need to be altered based on your personality, do they? If so, this is just as goofy as about anything you would find in the 1960s version of this comic book. So the group comes back to Earth, and we get a few scenes of each of them kind of testing their powers and seeing what they are capable of while we also get to see how this is having an effect on them as people, which is good. Character evolution is always good most of the time. Then we have a few action scenes. The Mole Man attacks, joins the team, and then we get Namor attacking the surface world after he realizes that Atlantis has been destroyed and plundered. We get a couple of nice character arcs here. Reed and Johnny are more or less static characters here, and if you look at all of the Fantastic Four from their creation to now, you could say that they are static characters all of the time. Every time some writer tries to mature Johnny into more of an adult character, the very next writer will change him right back to what he is best known for. Reed Richards is always written as a timid, shy nerd, and then when some author tries to remind the world that, no, this is a guy who stole a spaceship to beat the Reds into outer space, the next guy goes back to treating him like Poindexter meets Plastic Man. And as true to history, these two don't really get very much of an arc at all. Johnny is an immature goofball at the beginning of the story, and he is at the end of the story. Reed is interesting because he is the one who pushes the idea that these guys become costumed adventurers, but he doesn't really go through any major change either. We are told several times that Reed is chauvinistic and pig-headed and arrogant, and I am having trouble seeing any of these qualities in him. Maybe if I had a better read on his character, or I saw him the way the book wants me to, maybe I'd have more of a clear idea of what his arc is supposed to be. Ben and Sue, though, I feel like get decent arcs. Ben more so than Sue. Sue is less of a 1950s housewife here than she was in the Stan Lee Jack Kirby days. It's easy to say what she isn't, but it's not so easy for me to say what she is in this book. Her big arc is connected to Reed, which is a little disappointing. She wants Reed to propose to her, that much is obvious, and her arc by the end of the book is accepting that that won't happen and that Reed is her man no matter what. It's not much, but it's more than some of the other characters get. Ben is maybe my favorite character in this book. We get several moments where we get to see a speed round of flashbacks showing what his life was like when he was younger, and then another moment where we get a similar scene showing what his life could be if he was a human. As you might expect, his transformation has the most impact on him, and Reed, with the help of his lab assistant and the Mole Man, figure out a way to transform Ben back into being a human. But then Namor is attacking New York, and if you've seen the 2005 live-action film, you will know where this is going. Ben decides that the safety of the city and the safety of his friends are much more important than him being a human. So Ben realizes that being the thing isn't all that bad, so long as it means that he can be there to protect his buddy, and then he and Reed get a truly wonderful scene at the end of the book where Ben explains why he did what he did. Overall, I enjoyed this book. It certainly wasn't perfect, but I had a lot of fun reading it, and it makes me want to read more comics with these characters. If you are a fan of the Fantastic Four and you don't mind a few discrepancies with the backstory of these characters, then I think you'd be wise to pick this story up. And if you aren't very familiar with these characters, and you want to be, I think you'll really need to pick this book up. And that's about all I have to say today. If you liked this video, I hope you will comment, share, like, and subscribe. And I hope you will come back tomorrow for another video. Until then, have a good day.